Hi everyone, I'm Mike Lewis, Head of Philosophy, just here to welcome Tina Chanter, whose talk you're going to hear today. Tina spent a lot of her career in Chicago at DePaul University, where she was Professor of Philosophy. She came back to England a few years ago to work first at the University of the West of England, which is where I met her, and then Kingston University in London, where she was Head of Humanities. She moved to Newcastle just last year to take up a position in philosophical studies in philosophy. And her work has always been firmly rooted in the school of philosophy known as phenomenology. But as will be evidenced by her attention paid to Emmanuel Levinas, uh, we can see that her work in phenomenology is not straightforwardly phenomenological. It's interested in the way in which phenomenology is not perhaps as neutral a description, not as objective a description of experience as it might like to be and as it might present itself as being. So this, to some extent, uh, may be gleaned from some of what Levinas says. But in particular, her work recently has focused on Jacques Rancière and what he has to say about the phenomenon, and in particular, the way in which experiences may be bestowed upon us, may be reflected by the artwork. And one of the things he's particularly interested in is the way in which there's always a political dimension to a phenomenon. A phenomenon in the, in the phenomenological sense, which is to say uh, simply our experience, the way the world or a certain aspect of it appears to us. There's always a political dimension to this in the sense that there is always at the root of every perception or every presentation of a certain event, a decision being made. A decision as to what elements of that experience, of that phenomenon, are to count, what elements are to become salient and what elements are not. So, in other words, in our perception of events, which seems neutral, there is always uh, a decision being made as to what elements of that experience are to count and what elements are to be discounted. Now, this is, uh, at the very least, a moment at which ethics has to get involved uh, and a moment at which politics gets involved precisely because here a decision is being made, a decision as to what is it in the field of our perception that we're giving most attention to and what are we somehow discounting, what are we not seeing. Um, so in other words there's a decision here in the sense that some things are being allowed to be important, to be salient and others are being thrust into the background. Now it's to draw attention to these decisions that you might say that a good deal of Tina's work has devoted itself, particularly in recent years, in its work on, um, in, uh, in its focusing on Jacques Rancière. So we're going to see today her speak about the uh, COVID virus and the way in which this event has been presented, the way it's been interpreted politically and responded to politically, and the way in which certain decisions may have been made in that very presentation and in that very response, which are, to say the least, questionable. And this is precisely what philosophy has to point out, and this is what her philosophy has done. So here is Tina's talk. Welcome to the lecture, Philosophy in Times of Crisis, Thinking about Coronavirus with the help of Emmanuel Levinas. Let me begin by thanking Mike for his introduction and by saying that it's an honour to be asked to do this lecture. In the normal run of things, we live in a world where we take for granted the simplicity of breathing, the enjoyment of food and drink, studying in schools or universities, reading for our own pleasure. We are used to going for a walk just because we want to take a walk. When we are prevented from leaving the house, when the very act of breathing the air we breathe is fraught with trepidation, when our habits of studying and ways of working are disrupted, and when our enjoyment of food is compromised by constraints around its accessibility, even concerns about its potential contamination, we can no longer take these simple pleasures for granted. Everything is turned on its head. The world seems upside down. As coronavirus developed into a crisis, I find my thoughts increasingly turning to the philosopher Emmanuel Levinas, who has been called the preeminent ethical philosopher of the 20th century. Yet it is not only ethics on which his philosophy expounds. His analyses also develop original and profound accounts of facets of life that other philosophers have failed to elucidate, perhaps because they might have appeared to be too mundane to be of philosophical interest. 
What draws me to Levinas's work is that he is a philosopher whose ethical thinking is embedded in day-to-day -day life, who has thought more profoundly than many about enjoyment, love, desire, sleep, insomnia, about the home, time, solitude, and about the world in which we dwell, and about the place of such moments of life in the larger economies of meaning. I draw here primarily on the philosophy of Levinas, a philosophy that was significantly shaped by his experience as a Jewish officer of the French army in World War II, during which he spent five years as a prisoner of war. In a pandemic, the allegedly ordinary pleasures of daily life come to seem, en come to seem anything but mundane. Perhaps this was also true for Levinas, who, while he was imprisoned in a labor camp, reflected upon the meaning of many aspects of the life that most of us, though not all, are usually able to take for granted, enjoying the freedom to take a walk in the fresh air or conversing with friends over coffee or dinner. When these pleasures are unavailable, we understand their importance in a new way. As Levinas says, it is not by being in the world that we can say what the world is. During the coronavirus pandemic, Wars, particularly World War, II, World War II, have been cited as providing precedence for what others have objected as unprecedented. In no way do I want to reduce one to the other. Clearly, there are many significant differences. Yet, as we struggle to come to terms with coronavirus, which prevents us with previously unknown phenomena in many ways, thinking alongside Levinas, whose work bears the traces of the experience he underwent in World War II, can be productive productive and fruitful in certain respects. When what Levinas describes as the sincerity of intentions in the simple pleasures of life is disrupted, and when we are deprived of the company of others, when everything is on hold, when time is out of joint, when we are exposed to the insecurity of indeterminacy, we can lose our bearings. Yet at the same time, we are afforded the opportunity to think, to rethink our relationship to the world, to ask ourselves what really matters. When our habitual ways of interacting with the world and with others are suspended, when time itself seems to be on hold, fundamental questions about ethics and politics also come to the fore. In what follows, I want to develop the sense in which, as Levinas understands it, we are in the world, as he puts it in Totality and Infinity, the sense of everyday life that has been missing lately before going on to think about Levinas's understanding of ethics in the context of coronavirus. Central to Levinas's account of ethics is his understanding of the face, although, as he says, his is a new way of speaking of the face. We might call Levinas's understanding of ethics hyperbolic, although it might initially appear that Levinas has little to say about politics or what he has to say is merely problematic, Critics such as Howard Cagle and Lisa Gunter have insisted that careful consideration of his work reveals a meaningful political critique. In that spirit, having alluded to the ethical impulse of Levinas' philosophy as relevant to coronavirus, I shall also indicate some of the perspectives from which, from which we might want to engage in a more polemical critique of recent events. Such a critique resonates with the recent flourishing of Black Lives Matter following the death of George Floyd. Section one, life is a sincerity. We breathe for the sake of breathing, eat and drink for the sake of eating and drinking. We take shelter for the sake of taking shelter. We study to satisfy our curiosity. We take a walk for the walk, says Levinas. As a rule, we eat when we are hungry. There's a simplicity that, to the satisfaction of hunger that is characteristic of what Levinas refers to as the sincerity of intentions. We are hungry, we eat, and we are sated. Life, he says, is a sincerity. The sincerity of intentions is what makes up the fabric of our lives, the fabric of our world. When food is plentiful, when it is there for, take, for the taking, there is a joy, a contentment, a simplicity in the satisfaction of hunger, in the fact that the world is given to me, that it is for me, that I am able to take what it has to offer, in the desire of hunger, there is a distance between me and the desirable, but a distance that can be crossed since I live in a world where objects are there in the world at my disposal. In the world, things are open to our grasp. This relationship of objects that are related to me is a relationship of intention, a relation between me and the objects, 
I consume between me and the world of which I partake. I am absorbed in the world, of the objects that slake my desire. This is the relationship Levinas describes as one of sincerity. I am at one with myself, at peace with the world. The world is made up of activities, pastimes, occupations, time for work, time for relaxation. The world is what we inhabit, where we take walks, lunch and dine, visit, go to school, argue, carry out experiments and investigations, write and read books. These ways of being in the world make up the, ryth the rhythms of our daily existence, and when they are missing, we are no longer ourselves. We are out of step with ourselves. There is, as Levelas puts it, a breakup with the world. Fundamental to our existence is the ability to choose to go out into the world, to be able to go to work, to school, to meet up with friends or family, to go about our daily lives. We attend concerts, bookshops, theatres, visit art galleries or museums, eat out or with friends, go shopping, play sport, go for a swim, walk in the woods or along a country path, along the seashore, we stroll in the city. Equally, we come home when we are tired. We need to recuperate from the demands of the world. We need a place that we can call our own, into which we are able to withdraw, to find respite, to be alone or with loved ones, to enjoy the privacy of our own domain. The ability to extract ourselves from the business of the world, to remove ourselves from its hustle and bustle, to retreat into the relative peace and quiet of home, to lay down our heads and sleep when we are tired, is part and parcel of who we are. To have the freedom to go out into the world, to try new things, to meet new people, to discover new places, to engage in habitual forms of recreation, to reacquaint ourselves with old friends, to revisit old haunts. All this is doable so long as we have a place of respite, so long as we have the ability to stop all that we are, do are doing, to take a break, to go home and rest for the night, to sleep, to renew ourselves, to rejuvenate ourselves, to be oblivious of everything and everyone for a time, to climb into bed, to let go of our daily business of being ourselves. Levinas calls this ability to let go of consciousness having an escape hatch. One of the great merits of Levinas's philosophy is that it takes seriously the significance of our daily interactions with others, our quotidian activities, while at the same time it acknowledges the importance of being able to withdraw from the demands of being in the world, the importance of a retreat, having a home, a dwelling, closing the door and shutting out the world, putting one's head on a pillow and going to sleep, withdrawing for a while, forgetting everything. When we cannot leave our homes, they can become places to which, far from providing respite, we begin to feel confined. Some of us will have become more used to living on, in our own skins than others. Those of us who have been confined to our own company will have found ways to occupy our time, whether in DIY, sewing, knitting, cooking, baking, painting, reading, playing games, keeping fit, gardening, writing, listening to music, to the radio, watching TV. Yet we will have also missed going out, seeing others, enjoying their company. Those of us who have been living with others will also have found ways of organizing our time and space in such a way as to create new routines and rhythms. But there will have been times when we might have wished for more privacy. Parents who have been living full time with children who might be caring for members of their family as well as working from home will have found themselves physically and mentally exhausted. Others will have been concerned about how to keep afloat financially, anxious about their own health or that of those they love. Some will be suffering bereavement. By insisting on the sincerity of hunger and thirst, in which an object accords fully with the desire, one is hungry, one eats, and one, one's hunger dissipates, one is satiated, Levinas distinguishes himself from the philosopher who was both profoundly influential on his thinking and from whom he found it imperative to separate himself. That philosopher is Martin Heidegger. For Heidegger, the world is characterized in terms of a series of significations, a circuit of significance, whereby everything is referred to a system of references. Heidegger's world is a referential world, a world of equipment, wherein the significance of each task I perform can be cashed out in the light of a further goal, for the sake of which it is undertaken. If I am hammering a nail, the end towards which my hammering is directed concerns the garden shed I am in the process of putting together, for example. The task performed in my taking up of the tool is to be understood in terms of the future goal to which it is directed, the end toward my activity tends. For Levinas, on the contrary, not everything that is given in the world is a tool. 
Heidegger's analysis for Levinas overlooks the sincerity of intentions. To take pleasure in eating food, to be content when we have eaten our fill, is to be happy. It is to have a joyful relationship with the food that we can reach for and with which we can fill our bellies. To eat one's fill is to be satisfied. Heidegger overlooks the satiety of eating, the enjoyment of food, overlooks the exceptional place that home plays in our lives, an exceptionality that provides us with sovereignty. At home, as a rule, we enjoy a measure of freedom and control. Once we have cordoned off a corner of the world that we can call our own, we can determine, for the most part, in the usual run of things, the terms on which we choose to engage the world. If Heidegger was right to distinguish the world and our experience of it from a sum of objects, says Levinas, he goes astray when he reduces the experience to an ontological finality, whereby the meaning of beings resides in a means-end model, in which one who wields the hammer does so in order to accomplish an end goal. If the meaning of all we do is construed in terms of the care for, for existing, if clothing exists for covering oneself, oneself up, there is no room in this analysis to see how clothing frees man from the humbleness of his naked state, says Levinas. The example is a telling one. It opens on to an essential dimension of Levinas's philosophy, namely his experience during World War II, during which, as is well known, civilians were routinely sent to their deaths in con concentration camps in a state of nakedness. That Levinas characterizes Heidegger's understanding of the world in terms of the usefulness of tools with reference to war materials signals the distance he takes not merely from Heidegger's philosophy, but also from Heidegger's implication in Nazism. For the operators of war, food is supplies for logistics offices, houses and shelters are a base. Yet for Levinas, such descriptions fail to capture how we live from food or wear clothes. For a soldier, his bread, jacket and bed are not material. They do not exist for, but are ends, says Levinas. By the sincerity of intentions then, which he thinks Heidegger's philosophy fails to capture, Levinas directs our attention to the complete correspondence between desire and its satisfaction. Desire, he says, knows perfectly well what it wants, and food makes possible the full realization of its intention. This model of hunger, where hunger can be fulfilled through food, diverges from the desire of love, which Levinas characterizes as insatiable, and which, he says, occurs beyond economic activity in the world. A handshake a handshake expresses friendship, but expresses it as inexpressible, and indeed, he says, as something unfulfilled, a permanent desire. In the caress of love, he says, there is the admission that access is impossible. There is also the ridiculous and tragic simulation of devouring and kissing and love bites. It is as though, he goes on, one had made a mistake about the nature of one's desire and had confused it with hunger, which aims at something, but which one later found out was just hunger for nothing. It is only in, in time, times of misery and privation that the shadow of an ulterior finality dominates what is otherwise a simple dynamic of satisfaction in which desire is felt and satiated as the end in itself. For Levinas, our absorption in the world is characterized by desire and not by care as it is for Heidegger. We eat because we are hungry and only in times, times of hardship is it true to say that we eat in order to live. Levinas thus differentiates his view from Heidegger, for whom worldly activities are primarily characterized in terms of an embedded structure, whereby the significance of each activity to future goals is referred to future goals. For Levinas, this neglects the sense in which the desirable is an end. For Levinas, there is nothing hypocritical about the worldly secular satisfaction of hunger, about the contentment that eating brings in realizing the fulfillment of desire. Differentiating himself from Heidegger's account of everydayness and in this in authenticity, Levinas says that says of the satisfaction of desire in the world, to call it every day and condemn it as inauthentic is to fail to recognize the sincerity of hunger and thirst. When eating and drinking becomes a matter of survival, when there is not enough to go around, when one has to eat in order to survive, when scarcity rules, when the familiar world in which hunger can be satiated is in abeyance, when one has to eat and drink and warm oneself in order not to die. When nourishment becomes fuel, as in certain kinds of hard labor, the world also seems to be at an end, turned upside down and absurd, needing to be renewed. Time becomes unhinged. 
If there was an unhinging of time for Levinas in his experience as a prisoner in a labor camp, many of us also began to feel unhinged from ourselves, from others, from the world during coronavirus lockdown. Section two, time. In an article on the difficulties young people encountered contending with lockdown, L. Hunt reported in The Guardian on the 9th of May that 17 year old Jacob McMaster from Belfast found it hard to adapt. Two months into isolating with his parents and younger siblings, Jacob says he feels bored and uncharacteristically irritable, like time is merging together. For Levinas, the relationship with the other is necessary for time to move forward. When we are deprived of the company of others, we are deprived of a meaningful relationship with time. Time is not the achievement of an isolated and lone subject, but the very relationship of the subject with the other, he says. Conversation is an opening toward the other, a becoming strange to oneself, a despite me instead of an as for me, a calling beyond what I would have wanted or could have thought, an affect that I cannot account for, a teaching that I could not have learned from, for myself, an understanding that could only come from elsewhere. There is something I read in the eyes of the other, a gift that takes me away from myself and reshapes me into something other, something new, something I cannot desire from my own little world with its preoccupations and familiarities. To miss the other is also to miss oneself with the other. To miss the self the other brings out of myself, but more than this, it is to lose the meaning of time. Time passes, to be sure, but its passing is a passing of the same. It is monotony, bringing nothing new, only the same routines, the same strategies for making time pass, for losing oneself self in past times, for immersing oneself in a film or a book. The other takes me somewhere other than the here of my position, the now of my instant. The other opens up horizons and possibilities that were not there before, gives me a future I did not know I could have. The other opens a future that on my own does not exist. The other gives me time. The relation with the other is time itself, the alterity of the future. The other no longer takes us out of ourselves when we are on our own or gives us back to ourselves anew. The other does not stop us in our tracks. The other does not teach us something new, does not demand anything of us. We are left to ourselves with the ticking of the clock, which only marks the nothingness of time. Time passes without the event of the other. Hours become days, days become weeks. We lose track of time, we forget what day it is. An article in The Independent published on the 4th of May reported that Google searches for what day is it had been steadily rising throughout lockdown. The other takes us out of ourselves. Section three, the face, a commandment obeyed. To help another, to go out of one's way, to come to the aid of another, to put yourself, as we say, to put yourself out, as we say, is the most ordinary thing in the world, and it is the most extraordinary thing of all. Time and again, we heard nurses and doctors, healthcare workers, cleaners and porters, transport workers and shop assistants respond to expressions of gratitude and thanks by saying, I am only doing my job. Under the circumstances of coronavirus, to do one's job as a health professional, to do one's duty, is to go to work in order to attend the sick and the dying every day, knowing that in doing so, one is accepting the risk of being infected with a potentially deadly virus, one is putting the other before oneself. For health workers and support workers to do their job is for them to put aside concern for themselves. It is to put the other first, to give ethical priority to the one who is weak. It is to elevate the other above myself, above my own needs and wants, above my safety, above my urge to protect myself, above my attachment to myself, above any concern for my own survival. In hospitals across the country, across the world, during coronavirus, doctors and nurses, health workers have put on masks and gowns, at least where these have been available, and they have tended to the sick. They have not left their sides. They have not left patients to die alone. They have comforted comforted them, they have cared for them, they have provided them with oxygen, they have monitored their progress, they have turned patients onto their fronts in order to enable them to breathe more freely, they have kept their spirits up, they have taken a break and then come back again, day after day, week after week, month after month, and hundreds of them have died. 
When on Thursday evenings across the UK people thanked NHS workers, there was an acknowledgement of the sacrifice that ordinary people were making in order to save the lives of others. In an outpouring of gratitude, people stood on their doorsteps and thanked those who were risking their own health, their own safety, their own lives to help others in their immediate need. In this situation, Levinas's hyperbolic understanding of the ethical relation to the other seems especially pertinent. For Levinas, the face of the other imposes an obligation on me, calls me to responsibility. The way that Levinas expresses the ethical responsibility to the other, which for him comes before all else, is often with reference to the face, which prevents me with a command, thou shalt not kill. In the face of the other, I read this prohibition. The other is the one who is vulnerable to violence, yet whose eyes forbid it. I could walk away and leave the other to die, or I could help the other. There is the factual possibility of what I could do to preserve my own being, the natural Darwinian possibility, and there is the moral obligation that the other imposes upon me, which brings into question my natural tendency to preserve my own being. The ethical responsibility is imposed upon me through the thou shalt not kill as a rupture produced with being's own law, says Levinas, with the law of being. I become responsible to the other, infinitely so. The more I do, the more I am obliged to do. My responsibility to the other deepens rather than abating as I fulfil it. I take on the responsibility of the other. I answer to the call of the other. I and no one else. In this sense, I am unique and irreplaceable. The eyes of the other do not make a general call. They speak to me, electing me and no one else as the one to whom the other speaks, to whom the other appeals. The ethical relation begins in the face-to-face -face relation for Levinas, where I and no one else is called to responsibility for the other. Never perhaps, never since the time in which it was formulated, has Levinas's account of responsibility in the face of the other seemed so pertinent. Putting the other first for Levinas is a matter not so much of choice or decision, as hearing the call of the other and responding to that call. One responds to the other in greeting the other. One's response comes before any calculation. One says hello, one extends a greeting. The other's presence elicits a response from me, and before I know it, I have hailed the other. There is something about this before I know it that is crucially important for Levinas. It is as if I have put the other first without any forethought, without planning, without deliberation without taking the time to consider my position in relation to the other. When I greet the other in this very greeting, I enact a social bond. I salute the other. I am called to acknowledge the other, called out of myself. I am for him, as Levinas puts it. The responsibility for the other is prior to any system of morality. It is a commandment obeyed before it is pronounced. In greeting the other, I put myself at the behest of the other. I expose myself to the other. I wait for the other to respond. In this sense, to speak to the other is also to hear the other. Levinas says, Speak and speaking and hearing become one rather than succeed one another. What is at stake in speaking to the other is not a matter of knowledge. Face to face with the other, the other accounts, sorry, the other counts as an interlocutor prior even to being known. In the face to face relation, I do not encompass the other. I do not contain the other. I might try to thematize the other, but the other will always escape my grasp. The face breaks with a model of intentionality, where the world is there for me, given to me, where the world is reducible to me. The face is not a phenomenon at which I aim. Rather, to look at the face of the other is to look at a look which aims at you. It involves looking at the face. The face has a depth that breaks through its form. To speak to someone is to address a face. To address the other is not to grasp or seize or possess the other as if the other were a thing, an object conforming to my idea of it, to the uses to which I might put it. Through the eyes, the other looks at me, regards me, concerns me, puts me under obligation. In the eyes of the other, I see the other as vulnerable. The eyes are absolutely without protection the most naked part of the human body, and yet they, are also, they also offer absolute resistance to possession, an absolute resistance in which the temptation to murder is inscribed. The face which tempts murder resists it at the same time. I can walk away from the other, I can treat the other as an object, 
Yet even as I walk away, I will have heard the demand of the other. The face is unviable, even as it is that which can be violated. The temptation to murder and this impossibility of murder constitute the very vision of the face, says Lavanas. There is a moment that keeps coming back to me in one of the many broadcasts broadcasts of hospitals treating people in intensive care units during the height of the coronavirus uh, during the BBC News. Perhaps it was a moment repeated all over the country, all over the world. Nurses and doctors are suiting up in PPE with gowns and gloves and masks. Most of their faces are obscured by their masks, only their eyes are visible. One health worker writes the name of another on her gown in black letters across the chest using a permanent marker. He looks at her eyes, sees who she is, and writes her name so that others will know by which name to call her. She says with a hint of surprise, you recognize me by my eyes. All that would have been clearly visible of faces of patients being cared for, patients whose breathing was being done for them by machines while they were intubated, would have been their eyes. The rest of their faces were covered by masks, fixed in place, equipment to increase the level of oxygen entering their lungs. To respond to the face for Levinas is not necessarily to see the face. The whole body or another part of the body might also substitute for a face. A hand, for instance. I can walk away from the other in his or her hour of need. Empirically, this is a possibility. In reality, people do violence to others all the time. People punch and kick others when they're already down. We also do violence in less overt ways. We eat when others are starving as if we were taking the bread from the mouth of others. When Levinas refers to the sixth commandment of the Old Testament, thou shalt not kill, he says, in the course of your life, in different ways, you kill someone. He goes on, when we sit down at a table in the morning and drink coffee, we kill an Ethiopian who doesn't have any coffee. To take my place at the table is to take the place of another, is to put myself first, to put my needs before the needs of the other. We do this every day insofar as we try to survive as best we can on a day-to-day -day basis, even in times of hardship. But we also, those of us who live in liberal democracies, believe in human rights. Human rights, says Levinas, are the reminder that there is no justice yet. Section four, critique, the day the UK, UK death toll rose above 20,000. On the day, the reported UK death toll from coronavirus exceeded 20,000, a figure way below the actual figure, since it excluded deaths in care homes and in the community. The following comparatively very significantly lower figures were reported elsewhere. Germany, 5,000. Denmark, 370. Norway, 182. Finland, 140. New Zealand, 18. Iceland, 10. Taiwan, 6. In all these countries, due to a combination of early lockdowns, the decisive action such as closing down borders and effective leadership, the impact of the pandemic was minimized and the death toll was limited. In addition to effective leadership, these countries happen to share another common factor. They are all led by women. How did Angela Merkel, Meta Fredriksson, Erna Solberg, Jacinda Ardern, Katrin Jakobsdottir, and Tsai Ing-wen achieve this? Through being firm, clear, and empathetic, suggest John Henley and Eleanor Ainge Roy in their article in The Guardian, adding that women leaders are more likely to be elected in a political culture in which there's a rel relative support and trust in the government, and that doesn't make stark distinctions between women and men. While there are also countries whose male leaders have managed the crisis crisis effectively, including Vietnam, the Czech Republic, Greece, and Australia. This stands in marked contrast to the UK government. At around the same time that the figures quoted above were published, it emerged that Dominic Cummings, whose early promotion of a herd immunity approach to coronavirus was widely reported, had been in attendance at several meetings of the group of scientific advisors that ostensibly constitute SAGE, the Scientific Advisory Group for Emergencies. The government was keen to keep its membership secret, repeating the mantra that they were they were being led by science, but making available neither the putative evidence on which they were relying, nor the identity of the experts whose scientific knowledge they claimed to be consulting. The revelation that Cummings had been attending SAGE came at the same time that Dr. Minal Viz and Nishant, Dr. Nishant Joshi were launching legal proceedings to sue the government over inadequate provision of PPE equipment to the NHS by suggesting that the equipment did not meet the guidelines of the World Health Organization. 
Dr. Viz pointed to the discrepancy between the equipment medical staff were required to wear the previous year when dealing with viruses, namely full sleeve aprons and FFP3 protective masks and a plastic apron, a pair of disposable gloves and a surgical mask that medical staff dealing with the coronavirus were now being told to wear. She observed that far from the government following scientific advice, quote, it seems like they're making things up as they go along and that guidelines have been based on supply and demand rather than science. Matt Hancock's response to the continued shortages of PPE equipment was to suggest that the NHS was overusing equipment. According to Guardian, the Guardian government sources to which a confidential cabinet office document dated 2019 was leaked, there was an alarming lack of preparation that suggests that government failed to follow up on the briefing. The 2019 risk assessment document specified the need to stockpile PPE, organize advanced purchase agreements for other essential kit, establish procedures for disease surveillance and contact tracing, and draw up plans to manage a surge in excess deaths. The unnamed source that leaked the 2019 national risk assessment briefing, which was signed off by Sir Patrick Valance, the government's chief scientific advisor, suggested that the failure of the government to take action on the report was because its focus had been elsewhere on Brexit, for example. Gaminda Bambra suggests that the logic of Brexit was based on a cultural amnesia of what she calls methodological whiteness that allowed the white middle class to conveniently forget the colonial imperial history that shaped Britain and the race relations that undergirded it. It is as if the empire never happened. This disavowal of history allowed Brexiteers to envisage migrant workers as disposable outsiders who do not really belong to the nation. As Bambra puts it, the Brexit years, as we might call them, were defined by a narrowing of vision of who constitutes the body politic and who ought to be considered the legitimate object of public policy. In other words, who belonged, who really belonged, and who did not, whose grievances merited attention and whose did not. The newly designated key workers were disproportionately migrants, disproportionately of ethnic minority background and disproportionately dying, not only because they were being disproportionately exposed to the coronavirus, but also due to a host of socio-economic race related factors that are systemic rather than biological, as some authorities implied, despite the fact that the race, that race as a biological concept has been discredited. As their faces appeared on the front pages of newspapers, it was difficult to ignore the fact that many of the people who were keeping the UK going and saving lives at considerable cost to themselves were, were low paid, routinely unappreciated, undervalued and stigmatised workers, all of a sudden categorised under the new nomenclature as key workers. Many of these people were the very people that Brexiteers wanted to keep out. When so many BAM the NHS staff had died due to the combination of systemic racism and a lack of sufficient PPE, a lack stemming from the Conservative government's failure to adhere to a 2019 national risk briefing warning of a pandemic precisely like COVID-19, and in the light of the continued mishandling of the pandemic, which has led to the highest death toll in Europe and the UK, we might ask ourselves how this was allowed to happen. Marius Meinhof suggests that Europe's slow reaction to coronavirus can be attributed to post-colonial arrogance. There was no lack of information, language ability, or time to learn what had happened in China. There was a lack of relating Chinese disasters to us due to a prevailing, to, to prevailing notions of Orientalism and colonial temporality. As part of its consistent failure to take responsibility for its own absence of planning, its chaotic efforts at testing and its inefficiency in implementing the financial measures it promised, the government insisted the government instead projected its own failure onto the very people it continued to blithely sacrifice by not providing them with adequate PPE and then blaming NHS staff who were risking their lives to save the lives of others for overusing PPE equipment. Perhaps this is because members of the government still don't really acknowledge such individuals as belonging, as really belonging to Britain. Perhaps the imaginary whiteness of Britain that fuels the cavalier attitudes of some members of the government colours their view to such an extent that they are incapable of doing anything other than blaming those that they continue to other. This raises the question of how far those who continue to sacrifice their lives in a context in which the UK government is systemically failing to protect them are perpetuating a political system that, that sees their deaths as negligible. In a short essay originally published in 1966 under the title Honour Without Flag, 
Levinas draws some lessons from having undergone World War II. While the circumstances under which he draws these truths were very different from lockdown under coronavirus, there were also some significant similarities, and the lessons to which he points have a bearing on the new world in which we find ourselves. In both situations, our usual ways of being have been suspended, as if, in Levinas's words, being itself had been suspended. Everything is put on hold. Life itself seems to be waiting in the wings in such circumstances when things are out of kilter, when everything that we normally take for granted, freedom of movement, interacting with others, going to work in order to conduct our daily businesses, business, those of us who are not on the front lines, as people have begun to say, in an image that capitalizes on the parallel I'm developing here, might have found themselves the time to think. Levinas certainly did. Suspended in a kind of limbo, a Jewish prisoner in the French army, no longer able to contribute to the war in which he had served as a translator of German, Levinas did not know when the war would end. Neither did he know how it would end. Despite the flimsy protections of the Geneva Convention, which in principle exempted him from the death to which Hitler's regime tried to condemn all Jews, Levinas's future was radically uncertain. Would the Allies manage to overcome Hitler's forces in the event that the Allies were successful? Would he be killed nonetheless out of revenge whenever the war finally ended? We did not know how we would fare and still don't during the coronavirus epidemic. Our future too was and still is uncertain. Philosophical issues that previously might have seemed abstruse began to appear in a new light. All those utilitarian thought experiments about whether it would ever be justified to throw someone overboard a lifeboat in order to preserve the lives of others became all too eerily relevant as people in their 80s reflected upon whether they would agree to admit themselves into hospital were they to contract coronavirus. Hobbes's envisaged state of nature as a war of all against all began to seem less fanciful as we saw news reports of long queues of Californians waiting to buy guns or heard of people buying deep freezers, emptying the supermarket shelves in a frenzy of panic buying in their efforts to fill up their new freezers. Meanwhile, hospital workers with only an hour to spare between long exhausting work shifts were confronted with bare shells, while those without the financial means to stock up came unstuck. There's another moment that stays with me. Dawn Bilbrough, a critical care nurse in New York, video recorded herself sitting in the car. The video went viral. She had just come from a supermarket where she had wanted to, bu to buy food in the short amount of free time available to her between long hospital shifts. The shelves had been empty. She made a tearful, desperate appeal, asking people to stop stockpiling food, preventing others like herself from procuring it. People who were working daily to save the lives of people like those who were stripping bare the shelves. In the days following this appeal, food became more readily, more steadily available. People stopped buying up all they could find. Supermarkets began imposing limits on the number of items customers could buy. There's no way of knowing, of course, what direct causal impact the nurse's appeal had, but I guess that it was significant. Uncertain times seem to bring out both the best and the worst of us. 750,000 people volunteered to help the NHS, while across the UK, people took the time and made the effort to go out in the evening to thank NHS workers for their dedication and commitment for the daily risks that they took, cheering and clapping them from their doorsteps and balconies, although some NHS S workers began to feel that they needed more help and less thanks. Others engaged in arson, turning the wide green hills of Cumbria into black tracts of scorched land, abusing the valuable psychic and physical resources of those who serve in the fire brigade. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. One of the two is Levinas draws from his time in captivity and a Jewish prisoner of war, as a Jewish prisoner of war in an, a labor camp between 1940 and 95 is that we do not require a great many things in order to survive. To live humanly, people need infinitely fewer things than they dispose of in the magnificent civilizations in which they live, he says. One can do without meals and rests, smiles, personal effects, decency and the right to turn the key to one's own room, pictures, friends, countryside and sick leave, daily introspection and confession. We need neither empires nor purple nor cathedrals, academies, amphitheatres, chariots, steeds, he says. All that had previously seemed indispensable suddenly seemed suddenly attained merely relative importance. 
As we stayed in our residences, going out only to exercise or buy essentials, we too made do with infinitely fewer things than is customary for most of us. Unlike Levinas, most of us were not literally in captivity during coronavirus lockdown, but to some of us, it might have felt as if we were. Levinas describes the space to which he was confined as a space made to measure like a tomb. When our usual relationship to the world is suspended, when we are exempted from being able to engage in so many of the activities that we usually take for granted, those activities take on a newfound significance. Ultimately, the ethical aspects of Levinas's philosophy cannot be divorced from his philosophical considerations of ordinary life. In times of crisis and deprivation, it is perhaps his appreciation of day-to-day -day realities, material and social, as much as his ethical insights that might resonate. Routinely during the coronavirus pandemic, we, were, we rightly heard about the importance of science, the imperative of developing effective testing for the virus, the imperative of finding a vaccine. There is no doubt of the significance of these imperatives. Yet I think this is also a time that makes it imperative to think about the values around which our societies have coalesced and the ways in which some of us are impeded from appreciating the impact of the dynamic, of the dramatic systemic socio-economic inequalities that structure our world. It is time to ask about how some can be blind to the privileges in which their words are ensconced, to the assumptions they are making and to the differences that mark out their own lives from those of others. It is also a time for philosophical and critical thinking. The future of our universities is as much in question as every other institution and enterprise. Government policy over the past few decades has moved higher education progressively toward a business model where students are customers and where quantifiable corporate measures are what matter. The capacity for critical thinking has been systematically eroded, undermined and undervalued. Unless academic research can demonstrate impact measured in terms of its ability to promote neoliberal, individualist, capitalist values, it is unlikely to attract funding. Students have been taught in an atmosphere in which it is increasingly difficult for them to even understand anything but corporate values, the importance of making a profit, the values of capitalism. Now that the economic system has had to be put on hold and governments around the world have taken on the role of bailing out these businesses, those businesses that might still be viable, now that our very life way of life is in question. In these times, I would say, philosophy, reflective thinking about the fundamental assumptions that we routinely, that we routinely allow us to govern our lives is more important than ever. The precariat, as it has been called, has also been called a dangerous class, a descriptor that has come into its own in the coronavirus pandemic. Previously, many of us could turn a blind eye to the lack of sanitation, the overcrowding, the deprivation characteristic of some slum dwellers in distant countries as if the way they lived need not concern us. Now it is clearer than ever that their lives are of paramount concern to us. If coronavirus is not eliminated everywhere, eliminated everywhere, in every country, in every sector of society, it will pose an ongoing threat to everyone. If it took the emergence of a pandemic to make many of us attend to the plight of the world's poorest, most precariously situated citizens, if it took the threat to our own security to make us attend to the systemic insecurity of the lives of others, then so be it. How will those of us who have the relative luxury to reflect upon the precarity to those to which coronavirus has exposed us all respond? Will we react to this situation by acknowledging the equality and humanity of those who are routinely invisible, who routinely do not count, whose lives are routinely precarious, and by introducing lasting and meaningful measures to ameliorate the situation? Or will we react by shoring up systemic inequalities, making them more entrenched than ever? This remains to be seen. Thank you.